to unlearning economics i started the stream because we're a little bit late uh, i did put that in chat for everybody who was on youtube at least uh, to realize just because ben was running a little bit behind schedule he said he had a, a an article to finish for a very tight deadline but he is coming shortly i thought i'd just start this before uh you know people start dropping off and giving up and thinking that it, it it's not going to happen i remember at, <clears throat> at university the the rule was 15 minutes right if the lecturer didn't turn up in 15 minutes then you're allowed to leave um so yeah we hit 18 minutes so i'm, I'm hoping people stuck around but anyway hello everybody say hello how how are you all Oh, that's interesting, Mike. Um, yeah, I, I honestly never heard the uh, never heard of him. I'd, I would like to speak to people about physics and econo physics and the contrast between physics and economics. I know Jason Smith quite well, or you know, Twitter know. What's the word for what's the word for Twitter knowing somebody? I suppose that's probably it, isn't it? Um, yeah, I know, I know I know Jason Smith quite well. He write, writes a blog called. Uh, information transfer about him his attempts to use the like the tools of physics to create better economics and better macroeconomics especially um yeah so hello nova hello t-rex dirt feast when i was at uni if the lecturer didn't arrive somebody went and got them from the pub where did you go to uni australia Yeah, econophysics is a bit of a rabbit hole. There's some bad econophysics out there. There's no there's no two ways about it. I mean, there's bad everything, right? But I think econophysics is like, it's one of those things, it's like evolutionary economics or um, complexity economics. Like, there's loads of promise and there's some great ideas there. And maybe it's even the future of economics. But at the same time, it sounds cool and people are just like, people are just like yeah evolutionary complexity econophysics you know it, people just use it superficially and then assume that you know that's somehow insightful or sophisticated oh leeds yeah well that that makes a lot of sense if you if you're at leeds um there's not there's not not much to do in leeds is there except uh, except drink I say that as a as a Mancunian, by the way. So uh, that's why that's why I've got a bit of a, a rivalry with with Leeds. I know my accent doesn't sound Mancunian, but I am. I was born there, so that counts somehow. No, Leeds is actually a great city. I want to. Uh, uh, it's got a really good um, pluralist slash heterodox economics department in their business school at uh, the university of leeds as well it's somewhere i visited a few times i'd, I'd like to visit more but um the, yeah i've done like talks there and stuff and there's quite a few academics that i like there like a andrew meerman um for instance gary dimsky um there's i'm definitely oh david spencer of course um tad godowski yeah, quite a few different people at Leeds. It's like quite a cool department. I like. I like. I think if I were to get a job in an academic economics department, I think Leeds would probably be my first choice. Like, notwithstanding the fact that it's you know not London, and I'd rather stay in London. Right, where is Ben? He's uh, he's definitely fitting the stereotype of a. a standard philosophy professor um with this uh this kind of scatty lateness but i'm really excited to speak to ben because i've been following him for a long time uh you know literally on twitter and and youtube and stuff but you know just reading his work and stuff i think um he's made some really interesting interventions into into some of the very large large big internet debates that uh, i think have been really important to be honest uh. 
Okay. Oh, here we go. Um, as usual, guys, I've been trying to get better and better with the audio balance. You know, tell me, and don't be too picky, by the way. Like, it's never going to be perfect. Just, just let's just acknowledge that. But like, if it's bad, you know, tell me. It's likely he'll be quieter, if anything. Um, if he's too much quieter, like, please just let me know, and I can quite easily adjust it. I've not fully figured out, like, because the my headphones have been really loud, client end at my end. And then I think I, I think if I adjust the focus right box, then I um then that only does it my end. But if that hasn't happened, if it's done it at your end as well, then he'll be really quiet. So hopefully that's worked. That's what I'm concerned about this time. Because then I can have the Discord on really loud. Because apparently it needs to be like 150% to get, you know, in line with my shore, even when my shore's mic is down at like, you know. 50% or, or a little bit more. Is Ben Berg just being a philosophy prof qualified to debate economics from an economist point of view? It's a good question. Um, yes, because I've heard him do it and he's good at it. I mean, that's a good qualification. Um, so, yeah, like, uh, I, I, I think he's pretty, he's pretty good at it. Um, and yeah, philosophers can basically also debate anything. They're really good at arguing, as we'll see. I don't think I disagree with him on too much, so I doubt it will be like that. But but let's see. Anyway, we're gonna have we're gonna have Ben join us right now. Hello. Hello. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, very good. We are we are live. Um, are you able to put on video? Is that or? Uh, I should be able to. Give me a second. That'd be good. It just uh, just works a little bit better. Let's try this. All right. There we go. Um. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Right. Okay. You are now appearing on my um on my stream and uh yeah we're all we're all ready to go so yeah thank you so much for uh agreeing to agreeing to chat to me i'm, I'm really looking forward to speaking to you yes yeah, sir yeah so I've, I've been um i was just saying to everybody i've been i've been following you for quite a long time um on you know following you on twitter and following you on youtube and um seeing some of your interventions into these really big debates that we've had online across the past five years um and i think you've been quite an important voice to be honest uh, and i think also you know you've you've i mean you've written three books in this over sort of five years or something like that right so it's kind of interesting i think because i read two of your books today um one of them i'd already read um give them an argument when it came out but i reread it and then i read the cancel culture book as well um, so I guess mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to kind of go over them and look at them a little bit in retrospective as well, because I think the debates really shifted, hasn't it, since uh, since you since you began with your first book. Um, so so yeah. Anyway, um, I mean, should we start by going back to to your first book or your first big book? Um, it's called "Give Them an Argument: Logic for the Left," and. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, like, what kind of prompted you to, to write this book and to intervene in the debate? Yeah, so, I mean, in some ways, it's an attempt to do a couple of things at the same time. So one of them is to address um, certain kinds of right-wing figures who are really in love with the rhetoric of uh, facts and logic and reasoning and all that stuff, but for who I, I think uh, don't do a very good job of <laughs> uh, of actually you know implementing those things. Um, so that's that's definitely part of the agenda of the book. But then like also the other half of that was to to try to convince uh, people who I do agree with politically that these are sort of worthwhile tools that they should take on board and think about and study even that there's there's some kind of uh, value to that that uh, because
the dynamic that I felt like I was seeing a lot when I was writing that book was on the one hand, uh, some of the worst people in the world would, uh, would talk constantly about how, um, you should, um, you know, about how important it was to, to sort of do good, uh, good reasoning, you know, facts and logic and all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, I think here about like, you know, Ben Shapiro talking about how facts don't care about your feelings or, um, you know, there's a certain kind of online personality who's very influenced by like Ayn Rand who made a big deal about uh, the, you know, the laws of logic uh, in a way that made it seem like she thought that there's some sort of innate link between that and her preferred moral and political program. And on the other hand, I would see people who I did agree with people who were on the left uh, who share my goals, who would, I think, maybe overreact to the first group and sort of roll their eyes uh, when they heard a certain kind of logic talk or especially when they heard people talk about logical fallacies and um, and, and sort of see that as, as kind of um, irrelevant at best to thinking about politics or maybe even would equate it you know, I sort of see it as a, uh, like an unhelpful affectation or maybe even equate, equate it with sort of liberal centrist civility politics, you know, let's all just kind of sit down and talk about this stuff. Uh, and, and I wanted to sort of show them by means of debunking people in the first group that no, there's actually some, there's actually some value to, um, there's some value to, to learning this stuff. There's there's some uh, there's there's something that's useful that you can get out of it. That this can make you to help you think more clearly about what it is that you want and what's wrong with the things that your your ideological opponents are saying. And it's it's not good, uh, you know, because I, I guess this is the last thing I'd say about this before throwing back that like. It seemed to me that when I looked at certain kinds of lefty spaces and media and online that, you know, stuff that I agreed with by and large, I, it seemed to me that the main tools that people had for pushing back against, against the right rhetorically uh, were either sort of mockery or moral condemnation. And I'm not, you know, against either of those things, right? I, I don't, you know, there are plenty of things in the world that deserve to be morally condemned. And I don't know how you're supposed to get through your day without a little bit of mockery, but um, <laughs> it, it did seem like if those are the only tools in your you know, conceptual arsenal, then I think that's going to have some real limits. You're not going to persuade a lot of persuadable people a lot of people are going to understandably come to the conclusion that you don't really have a good response to your interlocutor's arguments, um, or else you'd get around to saying what it was at some point. Uh, it's a bad look. And also, you know, frankly, to, just to preview the second book a little bit, something I said in the first one is, if these are the only tools in your arsenal for pushing back against the right, when disagreements arise on the left as they tend to very, very, very regularly. These are the only tools you're going to have to sort of hash out these disagreements internally. And, you know, that's, that's a very bad look. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you um, on, on pretty much every count. I think your cat was quite, uh, quite, uh, yeah, agree, he was. agreeing was with you as well. I'm not sure if he was agreeing or disagreeing, but um, yeah, he was getting involved. <laughs> I have a lot to say. I don't know if I should get up to let him in or what. But. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, so I think we'll 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 talk about the left a lot. Uh, I think in this in this yeah. conversation. Um, for now, let's stick to the right because I think one of the things you do really effectively in the book, um, and which I've seen a lot of people do, like Matt Brunig, who you cite at one point, mm -hmm. is you show that you know a lot of these facts and logic type people uh the type of people who you know uh, know the uh, wikipedia page for logical fallacies off by heart um yeah. they, they, they you know their arguments really aren't aren't necessarily logical mm -hmm. yeah for sure um i mean and and i i think one of the things that actually hit me while i was i was thinking about the book and i was i was actually writing it is that I do think that that me and my kind share some part of the responsibility for that, by which I mean, like people who've taught um, like introductory informal logic classes, uh, because certainly when it comes to fallacies in particular, um, 
just structurally, part of the problem with teaching those classes is that, you know, part of your job as an instructor is to come up with grades at the end, right? You know, that's, that's uh, you know, that's unavoidably a big part of it. And uh, so you have to find some way of testing people. And by far the easiest way of testing people is to sort of give them these like very clear toy examples of things that they can just like quickly identify on a test. And I'm, I don't even know that there's no value to doing that, but the, the peril of doing that is that you end up making it like easy for people to identify very, very obvious examples, but you're not really teaching them probably the most important thing, which is some kind of sense of discernment about when these things are actually present and when they aren't. And especially, frankly, when you have a certain kind of person who does tend to be attracted to the right, I think, uh, who is very interested in sort of performative point scoring. And then it's these things can come together in a really tedious way that you, uh, that, uh, that everything, you know, you just, you just see these, you just see fallacies everywhere, whether they're really being committed or not, because it's like an easy way of very quickly showing how much you know and uh, shutting down the person that you're talking to. So any um, citation of expert opinion is appeal to authority. Any any time you say something negative about somebody, it's ad hominem. Um, and that's not just inaccurate, although it is, and I, I do spend some time in the book trying to show why those are inaccurate, but it's also... Um, just really unhelpful in terms of what these tools are actually good for. Because if you're interested in not just like displaying how smart you are, but in actually trying to figure out what's true, then just kind of quickly dismissing an argument because, you know, it maybe sounds like it could, you know, it could commit some, some sort of bad reasoning without re you really thinking about, okay, does it really, or is there a different way I could interpret this? Is there a core of this that might be reasonable anyway? Is going to be like really, really unhelpful to like actually trying to figure out what's true. Yeah, another one that I see quite a lot is um, is bad analogy. I think people are kind of overuse <laughs> that. They kind of use it reflexively. Just basically, when anybody uses an analogy that they decide they don't like, <laughs> um, it's a bad <laughs> analogy, right? And I think one of the things you communicate really well uh. is that you know an analogy is an opportunity to explore you know how two things are the same and how they're different and you know it, it admits careful consideration right um which is which is not what you're going to get admittedly having just said that bad analogy is thrown around too much <laughs> ben shapiro is quite guilty of doing these or at least doing them or, very quickly yeah. doing them very quickly and then not allowing people the opportunity to explore them yeah, so like an example that I give in the in the book is from a um, this is from a New York Times article that will live in infamy. Um, it's <laughs> maybe not maybe not as much as like their articles about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq in two thousand two and two thousand three, <laughs> but you know somewhere in a lower but still pretty bad category. Uh, there's a uh, profile they did uh, several years ago of Ben Shapiro that was uh, actually called uh, the Cool Kids Philosopher. So, you know, uh, just I I don't know. Whatever I, New York I Times editor. I'm so, like I, I'm sorry, like uh, you know, let's stick 99% to arguments. But I actually would say Ben Shapiro would probably not consider himself cool. It's a very <laughs> very odd title that. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, I I actually think give him credit where credit's due. He probably wouldn't claim that for himself. But uh, yeah, it's a very odd title. And in the argument in the in the article itself, they sort of uncritically quote all these people saying things like one of them describes him as the uh, destroyer of bad arguments. But there's only really one example in the argument in the article of him supposedly destroying a bad argument which is um, a exchange uh, with a college student, which is a form that a lot of uh, Shapiro's interventions take, that he, um, the sort of Shapiro, you know, patented Shapiro formula is that he'll go to college campuses, give talks. If there's some sort of protest or heckling, that's like, you know, that's like Christmas in Shapiro world, right? You know, because they could, they could die out of that for a long time. But if there's not... They could still have um, like young, you know, liberal or leftists uh, who show up in the Q and A, and 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 you know, sort of take their shot at challenging him, and often not very well 
because uh, we tend to be talking about like nervous 20 year olds who've often never actually uh, challenged somebody in a public forum like this before. And then he shoots them down very quickly. And then uh, his uh, team can harvest that as a YouTube clip, you know, Ed Shapiro destroys college SJW, whatever. <laughs> and it was exactly this kind of thing. And uh, there's this girl in the audience who asks him, um, who like challenges his his position on uh, trans people, which which is a very straightforward kind of biological essentialist, uh, you know, men are men and women are women, and that's that uh, sort of view. And uh, and he he owns her uh, by by saying, well, how old are you? And she says, whatever, I'm 22. I don't remember how old she is. And he's like, well, can you just decide that you identified as 60? And then she doesn't quite know how to respond to it in the moment. And it's like, ah, you know, Shapiro wins again. And that that just struck me as like a, a kind of perfect case of why uh, the sort of hasty, unexplored argument by analogy is so bad. Uh, because if you were actually trying to figure this out um, and, you know, and I think thinking about all of the different things that maybe we mean by gender, for example, that, you know, it's, it's some complex, like it's, it's a little bit of a complicated issue. And if you actually were trying to figure out like what's, what's true there, how we're really using language, what would sort of follow from that morally or politically, you'd want to sit with that analogy for a minute, right? You know, he'd want to like give, give the woman in the audience a chance to sort of catch her breath and start to explore possible disanalogies between those two cases. Um, but that's not the point, right? The point is, is just to sort of score that, that sense of performative, you know, win in, in the moment, which is, which is just, um, again, if you actually want to figure out what's true is just incredibly unhelpful. You'd want to slow down. Uh, before we continue, is your cat okay, by the way? Do you need to? Yeah, my cat is fine. He, <laughs> okay. uh, he, he's very, he's very talkative. Most of the time it doesn't mean anything. My wife is in the other room where he is. I, I, I think if he does desperately need something, okay. he'll be all right, but I don't okay. think he does. Okay, okay. I, don't, I don't want to, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to deprive a cat of uh, care. <laughs> Um, so, so, um, yeah, I mean, just to give, so, you know, it's a really good yeah. example. I think you can throwing out age as like a metaphor, uh, for, for gender, you know, you, you can just, there are so many different aspects of mm. someone's identity. Um, there are so many different aspects of what makes a person, you know, for instance, you know, religion is a big part of someone's identity. Mm. You can, you can change religion. Um, you can't mm. change age. Uh, you know, you can change gender, uh, you know, they, they, it's not necessarily yeah, yeah, the case exactly. that they're all the same, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like at the very least, like you could say, okay, here's one analogy. Here's one example of something that has to do with somebody's identity that we don't intuitively think we can change. Here's another one we do. And now we can have an argument about which one of these is more like gender. But like, uh, but that would be the beginning of the argument, not the end of it. Um, I'm sorry. There's a bit of drama on my chat. I'm just, I'm just uh, checking it. Um, no worries. I don't, uh, can you all settle down, please? I actually don't know what's what's happening. Kevin, I think I'm going to have to time you out. I'm sorry because uh, just too too much aggression. I'm not sure who's in the uh, right exactly, but just be nice to each other for heaven's sake. Um, anyway, so so I'm sure you, I'm sure you, you've been on the internet for a long time, Ben. I'm sure you've had th that experience as sure. well. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, um, I mean, you do. We're kind of skipping to your second second book here, but while while we're on the subject. That you yeah. do discuss the interesting analogy between trans racialism and, and trans mm. transgenderism, right? So, I, I mean, I, yeah. I was really curious about your thoughts on that because I feel like your opinion actually differs from mine there. Yeah, um, so I think that it is not obvious to me, right? I don't know that I have a super settled view on this um, and... The good news is that I'm not sure how much it matters because I think in practice it doesn't come up very much. But um, it's not obvious to me that the usual attempts to sort of say, well, there's no such thing as being transracial, um, completely work. Uh, that, 
you know, a lot of times I think very well-intentioned people will try to say, well, these are completely different, and um, and you you can't. Um, it doesn't, you know, it can't make sense to say that, you know, that you, you, you know, are, are uh, born in such a way that people would, would conventionally um, identify you as being a member of one race, but you identify, you know, but uh, you identify as another and that should be respected. And there's, there's maybe even some sense in which you really are that other. Um, I, I often see people say, no, 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 that's, that's different, and you can't do that. And then what they proceed to do is come up with a bunch of things that would actually apply just as well to either, um, either case. And so I think that, um, yeah, I think at the very least it's, it's, not, it's not obvious, it's not an open and shut thing for me that um, that, that, ca that couldn't possibly make sense. Um, I also think it's it's a little bit. Um, I, I mean, I think what what one thing maybe I, I'd actually be super curious about what you think. I mean, one thing that maybe that complicates that one a little bit for me is that um, is that gender is at least linked to uh, to sex, right? You know, to biological sex, and um, and so in a way that perhaps makes it inevitable or at least very very likely that humans are going to sort themselves in some way like this uh, in in any foreseeable uh future whereas um you know race is a much more recent uh idea and it's not as and you know and, and in fact one of the things that one of the things that strikes me as a little odd about some of these attempts to uh to say well okay um you can be transgender but being transracial doesn't make any sense is that it uh, is that it it seems very it would seem very odd for being a member or not a member of one race to be more linked to biological characteristics than being a member or not a member of a gender given that um you know i mean I, you know all this whatever but i mean like given that just in the relatively recent past uh what counts or what's held to count as being you know as being one race or another race has like shifted all over the place and in sort of crazy and fluid ways, like much more than sort of conventional ideas about gender have. Yeah, it, it's that's that's a tricky argument, isn't it? Because I guess I mean you you're kind of at risk if you're linking gender to sex, which I think I think there is <laughs> some link in in you know I mean you're right. talking about overlapping probability distributions. I think that's the best way to think about it, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, there there is some link, but then you sort of you get you get into the issue of you know, does that mean that there's some objective indicator where if we have that, yeah. then we say, it, you know, it, we can read somebody's brain or something, and then we know that they have like a, a male brain, for instance, to be you know to simplify things, mm -hmm. and we and then do we say, well, you're not trans, but if they're saying I am trans. You know uh, that that's the difficulty with these biological links, isn't it? Um, it does yeah, seem I'll, to. Yeah, I would just yeah, yeah. I would, I would just jump in on that for a second and just say like, um, I mean, I think like going back to Shapiro and his ilk, one way you know certainly one way of using terms like gender, man, woman, etc., is just to use it to refer to, um is just to use it to refer to like natal biological sex. And um, there, and you know, I think that's like a fairly coherent, you know, way of, of using it. But like where I would part way from all those people is that it does seem to me that like language is more complicated than that. Sometimes we use the same terms to mean more than one thing and we use the same terms to mean overlapping things. Uh, and you know, maybe they usually overlap, but sometimes they don't. And then we have to decide, you know, how we, uh, how we want to use language. And I think there's a, then there's like a moral question, right? I mean, is, is it, you know, I mean, the analogy I use in the first book, which, uh, is partially borrowed from the trans philosopher, so Sophie Grace Chappelle is, um, no relation to the more famous, uh, Chappelle spelled differently, uh, <laughs> is, um, is that, um, uh, is is look we can you know we could sort of do an approximate analogy to words like mother father and parent that there is a strictly biological way of using those words um, but there's also a, a social way that we all understand uh how to use those words and it depends a little bit on context and maybe usually they overlap but sometimes as with step parents and adoptive parents they don't overlap 
Um, and and then uh, and then we have a you know moral choice to make maybe about how we want to use language. And I, I think that you know the the way I extend Chappelle's analogy in the book is is you could imagine hypothetically a world where uh, whether to accept uh, step or adoptive parents was was like a hot button social issue, and the and there were like. I don't know bigoted school principals who who refused to allow adoptive parents to uh, to participate in parent teacher conferences because you know parent has a biological definition. Damn it! Um, and uh, and that would be you know I I think we would all I think rightly not think very highly of of that person. Uh, but then like in the so so you know but I I think what does where it does become relevant in the in the in the gender race analogy is not that I think there's some biological marker for being trans. I actually don't think that, uh, but just that like the, the category is, is at least relatively speaking somewhat stable because it's linked in this ambiguous way to this other category, which is, which is uh, sex in the, uh, in the biological sense. Whereas even what, what physical or biological categories "Quote unquote race is supposed to be linked to is historically way less clear." Yeah, yeah, uh, that that's that's an interesting distinction to make. I mean, one one final on on the on the transracialism debate before we move on. One oh. final thing is, um, I don't know, um, I'm going to butcher the history here, but anyway, I read Akana's mm. book Natives. I don't know if you've read it, and one of the I've interesting not, no. stories there was, um, I think he's talking about one of the Haitian. Uh, slave revolts and one of the ones mm. where they they were successful mm -hmm. at least in the short term um and the uh i think it was irish and possibly S slavic um slaves um were mm -hmm. were declared legally black um by right. by the successful revolution simply because they'd had that exact same almost exact same experience right as the as the mm. black slaves in that historical situation so i guess you know in terms of race right socially um there's something about history and about like how you know your experience um in society in society and uh, as a as a slave or you know perhaps as um you know uh, oppressed in some way yeah I, I think that's uh i think that that's plausible that that has something to do with one of the ways that we use we use racial terms, although it's also weird and complicated because because we use um, you know we do still use the term black, for example, to describe people who don't have uh, who don't have even the same like ancestral experiences, right? If if somebody um, you know somebody um, immigrates, you know from um, you know, from a from an African country, so they they don't they're not descended from American slaves. Uh, they you know, and and there's you know maybe it's a history of colonialism, so a different kind of oppression that's linked to that's linked to race. But uh, I don't know, even if they immigrate from Ethiopia, which wasn't colonized, you know, that the uh, we'd, we'd still apply the, the the term to them. I, I mean, I think that the um, again, I don't I don't have a super settled view on the on the transracialism stuff. Uh, the point made in context. Uh, was it was you know I was talking about a philosophy paper that was uh, that that was exploring this and was taking the position that uh, there there could be such a thing as transracial and the sort of attempts to like petition the journal to get it to retract the paper and stuff like that and why I thought maybe this wasn't a great way to uh, to 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 act but I mean on the actual substance of the issue I'm not really sure I think that you know I think that um, I mean I am sure that there's something like a little bit strange about people who think of themselves as being really progressive, spending a lot, like, sort of policing the boundaries of what counts as, quote unquote, really being a member of a racial group, because it's like, well, this is a conceptual category that was historically, you know, to simplify a little bit, but like, I don't think be entirely inaccurate, made up to justify slavery and colonialism. So I don't know how invested in that we should be. Yeah, and and I think um, in in the case of the um, the transracial woman that you also mm. discuss, you know, uh, mm. it, 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 I I can't I can't really speak you know too much on this mm. issue for obvious reasons, but I it it you know it seemed like a kind of laissez faire approach, given that she was one person, she didn't really seem to be actively harming anyone. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I would tend to agree with that. Do do you? Yeah, I, I mean, this is. Um, I mean, I. 
frankly, I always felt bad for uh, for Rachel Dolezal. That seems to be a minority opinion, but um, but uh, you know, there's there's an essay that I quote in the book by um, by Adolf Reed, uh, where um, where he has uh, you know he he sort of I mean maybe he's being a little bit playful about this, but you know he's like, look, I mean at least at least whatever her experience was led her to like actually do useful things in the world. She was in, involved in the NAACP, you know, which is uh, you know probably better than you could say for some of her critics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's important. Yeah, it's, it's something we'll come on to, isn't it? But you know, taking somebody without the context of uh, you know the good things they've done and just trying to focus on the bad things they've done. Um, but let, let's return to the right the right wingers. Yeah. I mean, I want to. Yeah, yeah, so please. it's really yeah. interesting to reflect on this because I think maybe this is partly my bubble. But mm. I have to admit, I was a little bit taken in by some of the early YouTube videos because I think I mean they've got really good production values. They're edited in a certain yeah. way. And look, Ben Shapiro, you know, he went to Harvard Law School. He skipped two mm -hmm. classes in school. He's not stupid. Um, mm -hmm. at least, you know, in the sense of he has mm -hmm. very high verbal reasoning ability and things like that. Um, so I, I was kind of initially taken in. But these days, when I watch one of those videos, it seems like a self-evident joke. Like, I just feel like they're really bad. I feel like everything he says is quite bad. And most of the debates where it seems that he owns the students, and you can put Jordan Peterson in this category as well, I'm just thinking, mm -hmm. you are committing some fairly obvious logical fallacies. And I'm not like, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not that great at spotting that type of thing. But, I mean, do you think that the debate has shifted and perceptions of these people have shifted? Uh, I think it depends on whose perceptions we're talking about. I mean, as much as I'd like to say yes, and, and maybe it has in some, uh, in some bubbles, uh, I, I'd also always caution people to that. I think we're all maybe a little bit vulnerable to sort of having a sense of like common sense about, you know, who's been discredited or whatever that's based on the people we interact with the most. <laughs> and uh, if you look at like, there's a Twitter account that does nothing. Uh, there's, there's one for Australia, but I think there's also one that's just a general one um, that, that just uh, does nothing, but like it gives like top 10 lists of like which posts on Facebook uh, got like the, the most like engagement and shares the day before. And a uh, post from Shapiro and the organization he's associated with, with the, which is the Daily Wire, like usually make it onto that list. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I think at his core audience, you know, he's he's still, you know, I, I think like all of these people uh, have, have just like in a way that's almost hard to wrap your mind around. <laughs> <laughs> have uh have fairly have fairly giant audiences and it's it's depressing you know but it's it's like I, that is the reason why you know because like sometimes people will say and i i get where they're coming from well look why why spend time engaging with people like this right like is aren't they just obviously ridiculous uh isn't this kind of uh whatever shooting fish in a barrel or whatever and, and yeah i mean I, I get it right but i also think that you you have to go uh, you have to go where people where people are, and and unfortunately, this is where this is where an awful lot of of people are, and um, and yeah, I mean, I guess, I, I mean, I guess like Shapiro can sometimes uh, be a little bit clever, but in a way that's usually like very superficial and is and doesn't reflect knowing very much um about you know what his his opponents actually think like if you if you listen to like i wrote an article for jackman a little while ago about you know this video that shapiro had done called like why marxism can't work in america and like what his idea his idea about like what what that term marxism means and all that is is pretty strange and you know and, and he's definitely in his own filter bubble but you know he can sometimes say things that in a sort of limited way makes sense. Like I think of a debate that he did last year with uh, Anna Kasparian, which is a very rare example of Shapiro actually engaging with somebody who isn't a college student. Yeah, uh, I and, saw that. Yeah. Um, I suspect if I had to speculate about what goes on in Shapiro's mind, that he, he might have thought for some superficial reasons that he would, he would, that would be an easier one for him. Than, than other people who might have made that offer, but um, 
that um you know i I think like being a woman being younger whatever like i I think you know all of this probably influenced him a little bit and you know overall i was really happy with how it went because because i think anna sort of did a good job of sort of changing the channel from the kinds of culture war preoccupations they want to spend most of his time on to like talking about labor unions and economic inequality and stuff like that and i was very enthusiastic about all that but like you know, there was a moment in there where they're talking about uh, critical race theory because Shapiro and and his kind are obsessed with that now. You know, critical race theory and how it's, uh, you know, it's it's infiltrated everything and it's in schools and all this stuff. You know, allegedly, and um, and you know, Anna said something that was true in there, which is well, okay, but I mean, nobody's teaching uh, Derek Bell or whatever in in like ninth grade. That's just not happening. Uh, and, and he did his very like fast talking thing and, and he said something that's like true as far as it goes, which is, yeah, okay. You know, I'm not going to try to do the Shapiro impression. I was, I was about to, but I just realized it was a bad idea. I'm not good at that. But, um, you talk like, about a quarter of the speed of him, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, um, uh, but he, he said, well, sure. You know, there's the, you know, if, if you mean the actual academic theory, then no, but you know, this is just a bait and switch because there are certain assumptions that are built into it that are reflected in things that people might actually say and blah, 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 which is fine. But again, like that's true, but that's, that should also just be the very beginning of a real argument about that because one, you'd want to ask, okay, are those basic assumptions actually untrue right like like if uh to you know because it it does seem to me that at least some of what people are objecting to when they say they're objecting to critical race theory is just like you know saying true stuff about american history uh but then the other one is like okay let's say for the sake of argument that uh somebody actually was teaching Derek bell in a high school classroom okay and like, like if you if you assigned uh, some essay or story uh, by you know by Derek Bell's big critical race theorist, and you know he did he did actually write some things that are relatively popularly accessible, you know that you could potentially do that with. I would say, okay, that's fine, right? Like, why why is that bad? Like, that's um, I mean, Bell says things I agree with and things I disagree with, but I also trust students to like discuss controversial ideas and come to their own conclusions yeah that's yeah i'd I'd, um i'd actually temporarily forgotten about critical race theory so thank you for bringing that (laughs) screaming (laughs) i'm I'm sorry i'm sorry Uh, yeah no i think it's 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 interesting i mean because i i agree that that debate was you know yeah she did she did pretty well um and i think um one of the things from reading the the comments and stuff which i always do which i shouldn't do but i'm uh, pathological for some reason on it uh this goes back to what we just said is it does seem that shapiro's audience are very like conditioned to see him as basically just winning every debate you know no matter sort of what he says i mean possibly with the exception of the andrew neil interview which we all know and love but like but you know everything else there's also one with with david pakman that fewer people know about by the way have you seen that one about gun control yeah that's worth watching but generally speaking i think they will just conclude that ben shapiro won won the debate with facts and logic you know almost no matter what happens in the actual debate yeah because they're responding to vibes Right, that the that the Shapiro's like half of Shapiro's thing has always been that he sounds so confident, uh, and yeah. so which is which is part of how I mean to reference another thing I'm sure everybody know is familiar with because it's a classic, uh, you know, which is why he can say stuff like oh, cli- you know, even if climate change is happening, it's not a big deal because you know what you have to water rises a couple inches, you know, you you have to sell some of your seaside property. And, um, and, and like a room full of adults can hear him say that and nobody like laughs at it because, you know, he says it quickly and he sounds really confident about it. So it like takes a few minutes to be like, wait, what? What did he just say? (laughs) Yeah. It's it's amazing what media training can do to the human mind. I think like the, you know, we, we, we just, 
we aren't that good at discerning competence from confidence, I don't think, at all. Um, and he, his career definitely plays on that. Yeah, and, and I should say, but this, there is a bigger issue lurking here, which is uh, that rhetoric, you know, is, is really important too, right? I mean, the, the focus of the book, obviously, is on, on logic, on thinking about the substance of the arguments, but also whatever. I mean, humans are a narrative species. We're, we're primed to respond to all kinds of things uh, besides, uh, you know, besides just the substance of what you're saying. And, and I think that, you know, obviously, if you're in the persuasion business, you should try to attend to all that stuff, too. And I mean, that's just inevitable. You know, I mean, you can sit around bemoaning it, but I mean, that will have some effect. Um, I'm just, you know, my... I was just kind of trying to target my intervention into the thing that I think that I'm the best positioned to help with, which is, you know, which is the part about getting the arguments right. Mm. I mean, I think a really good example of, of both rhetoric and arguments, which which springs to mind as we're talking is, um, did you watch Philosophy Tube's uh, abortion and Ben Shapiro yes, video? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, and did. I, like I presume you were probably familiar with, you know, before with the paper that it's based on, um, the violinist. Yeah, I can't, who, who's Thompson, it by? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's by Judith Jarvis Thompson. Who, yeah. uh, who, who? Fun fact: uh, even people who aren't familiar with her, if people are familiar with her, it's probably because that paper, the sick violinist thing, uh, it's called a defense of abortion. But uh, even people who aren't familiar with her probably know some of her work because she's also the person who uh, coined the phrase "the trolley problem." Oh wow! Okay, I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, but yeah, so the, the video, the paper's really good. I read the paper after I watched the video, but the video does a very good job, you know, it's the philosophy mm -hmm. tube, so it's very theatrical. Um, and it basically just, uh, is about, you know, saying that if you, if you kidnap somebody, um, and you, you, uh, hook them up, uh, to you, um, in order to sustain your life, if you need, you know, their, you know, their nutrients and, and things like that, or their blood, um, then they actually have a right to remove that that support mm -hmm. from you um, because their bodily autonomy, even if you're going to die, trumps your right to life, right? And I think right. that I mean, I mean, um, you know, it's 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 much. That's I've, I've done a very crude version of it, but I think that's roughly right. And that's, um, that's it's yeah, it's 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 such a it's a very compelling argument, and it's a really good example of what you're talking about, right? Because. Before that, I don't think I really understood the the abortion debate fully. Um, and I mean, I'm not saying I ever will mm -hmm. understand any debate fully, sure. but it really enhanced my understanding and, you know, firmed up my position on the issue. And it's just such a good example of give them an argument, right? Totally, yeah. I mean, what, so, yeah, I mean, the basic point that Thompson is making in, uh, in that paper uh, is, um, is that... Uh, Oftentimes, the way that the abortion debate is conducted in practice is about people will argue, well, the way they'll put it is they'll argue about when life begins, um, which I think is kind of an imprecise way to put what people are getting at. Because if you're really just asking about like literal biological life, then yeah, I mean, a fetus is alive, sure. But right? I mean, like in terms of a biologist checklist of of uh of the properties that are important for life uh you know it's like a little bit fuzzy but i mean it's going to check probably enough of those uh that's not really the interesting question the question people are really arguing about when they ask when does life begin is is more like when does personhood begin or when does a fetus become the right kind of thing to have moral rights and that's a really hard question because one there are hard empirical issues there because, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we're still learning new stuff and whatever, but also, and more importantly, um, you know, there, there's a whole tangle of like conceptual issues there, right? Okay. What, what do we mean by person? Like what kinds of things have to be true of somebody for them to be the right kind of entity to uh, have moral rights. And those, that is a really complicated argument, but the point that Thompson makes in that paper, which I think is fairly brilliant is okay. Let's just assume for the sake of argument that a fetus it is a person, whatever we mean by that, from the moment of conception onward, that they're the right kind of entity to have moral rights like a right to life. And, uh, you know, she says, look, I don't actually think that. Uh, I, I think a, like a three-day-old zygote or whatever is, is, 
she's quoting somebody, I think, with this part, but she says, like, no more a person than an acorn is an oak tree. Uh, but sure, at some point over the course of pregnancy, maybe they become one. It's really hard to tell exactly where you draw that line. But let's just assume that for the moment of conception onwards, they're a person. That only gets the anti-abortionists halfway to where they want to go. Because now we have a conflict between two rights, the fetus's right to life and the mother's right to bodily autonomy. And we need to decide which one wins. And, and usually people don't even really get to that part of the argument. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's really really well put, and I think yeah, it's like it really hammers home the point about bodily autonomy and how that um, can can kind of be you know contrasted with 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 the right to life, and those two values can be weighed up against each other. Um, and I think one of the things is so we can kind of get onto how how the left use logic, right? I think mm. it's it's. Te- you know, with with the way logic u- is used, can be used that you outlined at the beginning. There's, it can seem like there's something cold and heartless about it, right? Mm-hmm. And I think you know, you and I probably both share that. You know, the bottom line is for me. Um, you know, it, it, if somebody says that they're trans, like I think they should be supported. Mm-hmm. I think they should be recognised right. by society. I think they should have access to healthcare. There should be anti-discrimination laws that apply to them, and so on. But at the same time, you know, exploring the logical arguments behind all of this, and this goes for abortion, right? um, Mm -hmm. It it can really enhance your understanding. And it can also actually enhance your your passion and like, and how much you value these things as well, right? They it doesn't logic doesn't have to be purely cold hearted, it can be like David Hume says, right in service of, of the passions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the main themes of the book is is precisely to kind of try to push back against this idea that I think oftentimes both the facts don't care about your feelings crowd and also people who are maybe overreacting to that crowd share in common, which is this idea that like you know, logic and emotion are somehow in conflict with each other, um, you know, which... Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe blame uh, Star Trek. You know, all the all the jokes about fact about emotion and logic with Spock for that partially. But uh, but regardless, uh, it was to try to push back against that. Say no, that's that's there is no there is no conflict between those two things. At least now the way people think there is, because anytime you have normative conclusions, you're talking about what what should happen. Uh, then. Ultimately, you're talking about goals that you you care about. I mean, that's that's where the emotion comes in. That you know that you're that you're committed to those those goals. That you you want to, you know, you don't think uh, you know trans people should be mistreated in the first example. So you know you think um, that there should be anti discrimination laws and so on, right? You know, and that's that's the or you um, you know or or you think you know you're you're bothered by uh economic inequality or whatever right and you know cuz if you don't have that sort of driving passion for for some sort of underlying goals then um you know you're never going to get to the should conclusion cuz the facts alone can't tell you you know don't entail anything about that one way or the other i mean this is why you know you mentioned Hume this is why the cover image on that book drawn by my friend Ryan Lake is um Ben Shapiro starting to say facts don't care about your feelings while David Hume uh, hushes him, and because uh, uh, it's a good, it's a good cover. Yeah, yeah, it is. I was I was very happy about that, but uh, you know, but that's the that's the point, right? That like you can like once you've got some goals in place, then factual premises can be very important in helping you figure out how to. Uh, how to implement those goals, or they can tell you when you maybe have two goals that are in conflict, like you can sort of trace in the logic back and help you decide maybe which one you think wins, like in the Jewish Jarvis Thompson case. Um, but, you know, there's a fundamental sense in which it can't tell you, you know, what to care about in the in the first place, that there's no saying, you know, in that Andrew Neal interview you responded, you uh, you mentioned where he, he infamously storms off the uh, out of the interview because he was under the severe misimpression <laughs> that uh, that Neil was a biased liberal, rather than just knowing that um, Neil comes from a journalistic culture where people are actually taught to ask hard questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the people that Shapiro was used to talking to. Uh, in that Andrew Neil interview, he uh, one of the questions Neil asked him is, uh, "Why do you support these like really harsh anti-abortion laws that have just been passed in?" Um, in Georgia that seemed kind of barbaric and Neil sort of lists off 
the, uh, the the sort of severe penalties for having abortion in various places, you know, stages of the pregnancy and the laws. And uh, why do you why do you support that? And Shapiro's answer was science. And uh, <laughs> and he says, you know, what well, science? Because science tells me that the that you know, fetus is a human life in the moment of conception. It's like okay, sure. Um, I mean, nobody. I mean, yeah, a fetus is is genetically human. I mean, it's not like people are pro-choice because they think that a fetus is like starts out having you know being genetically a raccoon and only later changes to being genetically human. Uh, but that that just that's a totally separate question from uh, you know is it you know is this you know is this thing the right kind of entity to have any moral rights at all. If we're talking about a literally mindless cluster of sure human cells uh, in the very early stages of pregnancy, even if it is, does that right outweigh the mother's right to life? And you know, science can't answer those questions. Uh, doesn't pretend to. That's that's those are those are those are moral questions. Yeah, there was another example I think, um, which I was actually I had in mind earlier when I mentioned I find Shapiro unconvincing now. But you know. Um, I think um, uh, a young female student stands up and, and says um, about the, you know, how scientists now view sex and gender and, and you know, the complications. And, and then Shapiro sort of goes, well, that's false science. That's false science, you know. And it's like, right, okay. So the way he uses science, I mean, yeah, there's two problems here, right? One is that there's the unstated ought. And then the other yeah. is that it basically just means whatever he wants it to mean. <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. Um and and yeah, I, I think I think that's I, I think I think that's exactly right and it and it's 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 a it's a little bit silly. I mean it's it's the I mean it's the equivalent for that domain of uh to introduce a subject I'm sure you've never thought about before this conversation, uh the way that like a certain kind of libertarian or conservative will respond to any political conclusion they don't like by telling people they just don't understand economics <laughs> oh you you anticipated me uh so i'll tell you what i'll use that as an opportunity to riff a little bit because i was going to draw an analogy between you know what you've done with your book and you know you you could perhaps call my channel economics for the left um mm -hmm. and i think i see a lot of a lot of echoes and especially when i was rereading your book i was thinking you know on on the one hand you've got the right using terms like logic or economics as a kind of rhetorical weapon without actually really knowing anything about these and without really using them properly um and you know basically completely completely misusing them and abusing them to be honest um but then you've got like the left-wing reaction which just serves to to reaffirm the right winger's own perception that they're using logic or economics because you get things like leftists saying you know well the economy is just made up you know it's, it's not real and almost rejecting uh, any need for s systematic economic analysis and it's like you know what if everybody just had all the stuff that they wanted and it was fine um you know because we've made the economy up and that that just that just reinforces the right wing position and it doesn't get us anywhere so i think the two the two are really, really strongly analogous. Yeah, or or to do a, I, I mean, I guess I will say, uh, to take it to maybe just an incrementally spicier place. I also think that there are some leftists who've decided to sort of ape the right wing strategy here, and say that, um, and you know, and, and sort of adopt this kind of very sloganeer inversion of pop MMT and say, if you don't agree with that, then you, uh, then, you know, you don't understand economics and, you know, and you have to, you have to agree with all their conclusions. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. I think that the, um, that oftentimes uh, right wingers will use, well, one, I mean, I, I think it really is true oftentimes, like not actually uncontroversial or bulletproof economic assumptions and 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 sort of use them in these like very hasty, dubious arguments that, you know, doing, you know, doing anything the left wants to do will lead to disaster and you can't do it. And uh, and then oftentimes people on the left will overreact to that in ways that are incredibly unhelpful for the reason you just said that they'll, uh, you know, like, um, I don't know. I mean, pick an example. I think about a lot these days. Uh, they, you know, the sort of um, people will will raise um, 
these you know like like a, a long-term examples people raise like calculation worries about how socialism could work that uh how do you how do you have economic planning with without uh um you know, with uh, in a way where you um, you sort of efficiently coordinated production with uh, with consumer preferences, uh, and and then I think that like the move from that's a real problem to therefore capitalism is the best of all possible worlds. We've just got to keep a, keep at it forever is way too hasty, right? I think there are like plenty of places you could interrupt that train of thought, and and you know, for my money, should, but like there are all these incredible incredibly unhelpful responses to it where either one you just mock the concern as like oh under socialism we won't have enough brands of toothpaste which is you know i i think really understates what the worry is and i mean if you go back and look at like uh seth ackerman has a good article in jacobin several years ago called the red and the black where he yes that's quotes, a great article yeah and in the article he he quotes all of these like sort of letters of complaint and stuff that were written by um, citizens of different Eastern European countries uh, during the during the Cold War, where they they really perceived the sort of um, you know shoddiness and blandness and unreliability of of uh, and and monotony and scarcity of the products that are available to them as as um, as a real problem in their lives as as sort of evidence of the regime's neglect of them and you know and and makes the fairly obvious point that this is like a big part of the reason that these these places collapsed right that the uh that uh people didn't want to like fight to preserve uh that system um and and that you know i i think we we take we take that problem unseriously at our own peril and and people will also like I want to be careful about how I put this one because I, I think the book that is often influencing people, I don't think is a bad book. I actually think it's a good book, but it's a, um, but I think people sort of receive it in a really superficial way. Uh, there's a book called uh, Lee Phillips and uh, Mikhail Rzworski. Uh, it's called uh, People's Republic of Walmart, which, uh, which, 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 you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the book, and I think there's, I, and I think there are a lot of defensible points in the book, but the. But the sort of way the title comes from is, hey, look, this Walmart is this giant entity that uh, doesn't have internal markets to coordinate its activities. So, uh, you know, it's it's sort of carrying out uh, within this vast internal economy, it's carrying out economic planning. And I think if you actually read the book, Phillips and Rzworski are much more cautious than this about their conclusions at the end. But I think what a lot of people get out of it, unfortunately, is like, Oh, so this isn't a real problem. We don't need to worry about this. You know, that like that's exactly like how actually having an entire economy organized without a market site would work. And that's, you know, not true. It's 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 not a good analogy if it's taken in that way, mm -hmm. right? To to sort of give you that super confident conclusion. Like and, and it's and, and just sort of saying, Oh, I guess that's not a problem then, I think is is a really bad response because anybody who actually knows anything about this will will know that it's it's just doesn't it's not responsive to the worry. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good book, um, perhaps poorly utilized. I think that uh, People's Republic of Walmart. I mean, there are two main problems with it, right? One is one is how do you go from one company to the entire economy? You know, Walmart has right. uh, uh, yes, it's big, but it also has you know a clear. Uh, narrowly defined scope when you compare it to the rest of the economy and the single aim of profit and i think the other one is you know why do you want the country to be run like walmart right like i don't you know uh, what i mean i don't think that's a that's a kind of good um it's not really a good normative profile right for us to for us to pursue I, and and again you know the authors of the book uh, very nuanced like you said but then sometimes you just it's a real it's a really strange kind of tension i think because like on the one hand i'd be like well walmart is obviously a very ruthless capitalist company and you know a lot of the workers may not be treated that well and so on uh but look central planning works because walmart right i, I just find it a, a bit of a a bit of a silly argument to be honest the way some people use it yeah uh, yeah i mean it works in a certain sense that you know maximizes profits but um if you're going to go from that to um, you can, it's going to work in achieving all the goals that you presumably want a future socialist economy to to achieve, um, and you know then uh, then obviously there's a lot of extra work to do, and also it's um, also of course 
what Walmart actually does, right? What it produces or, you know, stocks in its shelf, uh, at least is ultimately guided, you know, by, uh, by, by price signals. And so it's, it's not, uh, at the very least. And again, I don't want to, I don't want to present this as, as bashing the book because, because all of these points are, you know, discussed in the book and there is a lot of nuance and reservation and caution in it. But like, um, you know, the reason I bring it up is just because I think that the, um, I think that, I think that the the sort of way that it's used sometimes is like, oh, thank God, we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> uh, mm. And and I think no, you actually do need to worry about that. Like you should probably you should probably worry a lot about that. That doesn't mean that you have to conclude that we have to um, uh, that your conclusion has to be that it's capitalism or nothing, right? That the mm. that like this is the this is the only or the best of all possible worlds. I think that. Um, you know, I th- I think that you can. You know, I think there are lots of different options for for how to uh, how to organize an economy, and you know, some of them you know some of them are are promising, and you can um, and and, uh, and you can have um, you know, and and you know, I I do think probably uh, a a potential post capitalist economy would have to have. Um, you know, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, would would probably have to have some market mechanisms. But I mean, like some market mechanisms doesn't mean you have to have an economy where uh, you you have uh, the kind of distribution of economic power that we have right now, and uh, where ordinary people have as little power to uh, to dictate what happens uh, at the workplace as they do right now, and where you know you CEOs make hundreds of times as much as you know workers and all that stuff, right? I mean, I, I think there are. You know, I think oftentimes the way right wingers sort of uh, weaponize these problems mm. is based on this false dichotomy between like let's just um, let's let's try to completely eliminate all markets and 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 hope for the best and you know maybe do the Soviet Union again or the Soviet Union but with like with democracy uh, or or else we just have to have you know capitalism and I think that's way too quick. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it, you know, similar to the logic debate, again, to bring it back round, right? It's very shallow on both sides. So you've got right-wingers saying, you know, if you only understood basic on economics, you know, just read Thomas Sowell, uh, all 700 pages of, of it, uh, and, uh, you know, you'll understand and and, and uh, that markets work and only capitalism is is uh, capitalism is the best economic system and then you you know you end up with some leftists coming back like oh people's republic of walmart kind of proves that actually central planning is good um and, and then you know there's just no room to explore like think about what purpose you know your your uh example or your argument is is serving because and i think you know having a narrower purpose for your arguments can often be really fruitful so you know the people's republic of walmart is a really good counterpoint to to crude kind of neoclassical type economic visions of capitalism as really mm-hmm. decentralized um you know atomistic markets that are competitive it's a very good counterpoint to that to somebody who says that you know planning can never work we can only have that kind of decentralized thing you know obviously planning can work in some situations within certain scopes and, and, you know, at certain levels. Um, And obviously capitalism isn't this perfectly decentralized system. Uh, But don't try and make it do more work than that and sort of just settle the the, the argument for you um, in a very glib uh, way that just reaffirms the sort of binary that you were talking about. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you can all, uh, yeah, I think one of the good points of that book too is that even with state economic planning, um there are domains in which i i think that at least given what the kinds of parameters of success that i would care most about i think uh you know fairly centralized state economic planning uh can be great right i mean i think healthcare is is a is a case like this that the that having um that um you know that having uh you know having the state uh have you know, take over health insurance uh, is a good thing, uh, and um, and and the empirical track record of it is good, and that's great. I mean, I do think there are relevant differences between uh, between health insurance and just uh, and like a lot of consumer goods uh, that that I think a relationship between those is really different in ways that you know that do make it more complicated than that. And, you know, and, and do lead me to think that, um, 
you know, we in thinking about this sort of bundle of economic institutions that we could have if you know if if uh, if we just got our way, you know, if, if if we just magically won the political war tomorrow and we could we could structure things however we wanted to, uh, wouldn't just be oh we can just do the entire economy like that necessarily, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that you can have, but certainly it's it's a good uh, it's a good counter to the to portrayal of capitalism you're talking about. It's also a good counter to the sort of overextension of calculation kind of arguments to say, oh, you know, planning will, or even state planning will like always be bad in every domain, you know, because because you know happily we know that's not true. One of the better um, mainstream economics papers out there is um, Arrow, I think it's 1963 on healthcare. I don't know if you've read that one, but it's um, mm -hmm. he, he basically invented the field of health economics with it, as far as I remember. And he just outlines exactly what you said, you know, the ways in which um, healthcare is different to traditional consumer goods and, you know, why the, yeah. the standard bare bones neoclassical theory doesn't apply to it. For instance, the fact that, after you know get if you get health care uh, if you get treated i'm not sure that's quite the right way to put it but you know what i mean um you don't actually know the quality of it even after you've that's got good. it so it's not even the case that you have to wait and try it it's like afterwards you know somebody a surgeon a good surgeon can do a, a, a you know an effective operation on somebody who then dies you know that right. that can happen, and that's one of one of the many many features of healthcare, which just makes it so different to um, to consumer goods. So yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting paper that one, um, and a good example of you know again how exploring these niceties, these arguments, these you know logical um, arguments can can enhance your understanding. Yeah, I, I'd also say like it's the kind of example like like not healthcare specifically, although that's a good illustration, but like thinking about some of the economic stuff is also i think a good illustration of why it makes some sense to emphasize like getting the arguments right getting the, the like inferences right because and and making people better at that because of course um not everybody can be an economist Right, I mean, realistically, uh, that's there's there's like specialized knowledge there that's just that's just going to be really unevenly distributed, and you know, which is not to say that popularizing economics is a bad idea or that we don't need more of it. You know, it's it's, it's not, and we do. <laughs> I'm glad you um, said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't want to get kicked off the call, you know, after I said what I just said. You know, but um, but um, but you know, but I I think that. Oftentimes, people are going to be understandably unsure what to think when they they hear certain kinds of economic premises being being introduced because they might they just might not have looked into it that much and you know we we don't all have time to look into everything to the extent that we might like to uh, but which is why it's really useful to be able to even when you're unsure about whether the premise is true to be able to. Um, to drill down on like, okay, if that is true, does your conclusion actually follow from it, right? Does, um, you know, do, do we have like, I don't know, one of one of the examples I always think about is um, there's all this debate about whether um, minimum wage increases increase unemployment. And, um, you know, so it's, it's good, which maybe is a nice example because it's at the opposite end of the spectrum of like uh, short-term, long-term from the stuff we were just talking about. And um, and there and so there are all these people who, you know, will will point to um, you know will point to some cherry picked study that says that it does definitely increase unemployment, and there are other people who will say no 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 if you if you look at this other one or you look at the meta studies or this review then like actually turns out most of the evidence doesn't really support that, and then the first people will come back and say no 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 but there are these these like methodological flaws in the even the meta study or they're looking at the wrong studies the studies they're looking at have methodological flaws, and depending on how much of your life you choose to devote to tracking this down you know you might be really unsure what to what to think at the at the end uh and and who to trust which is why i think it's also useful to be able to take a step back and be like okay let's assume for the sake of argument that you know i don't know raising the national minimum wage to 15 dollars or whatever will lead to and you pick some estimate that you know falls within like what people often say 
a certain amount of job loss. Okay, great. But if that's true, does that follow, does, does it actually follow that overall mm -hmm. this would be a net loss for the working poor that they, that, that, that the, uh, that the gains would, you know, that like the advantage, the benefits of doing this would be less than that disadvantage or, you know, or even if that is true, are there other policies that we could pair it with that would, that would offset that and, you know, and, and would still be better overall and whatever. And, and, you know, the, and the thing that's often frustrating about that debate to me is that usually people never even get to those other questions. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting if you take like the reviews by people like David Newmark, who say that the um, there is an effect on on employment. Uh, it, you know, typically the magnitude is actually very small, even if you completely agree with them. Which, by the way, for the re for the record, I'm uh. one of those people who who has risked. Uh, I wouldn't say wasting, but just spending my life in this sure, literature. Sure, sure. Uh, so, you know, it, it, even if you agree with them on, on the elasticity, on the, on the effect on employment, it's really, really small. Um, right. and, and I think one of the ways, so I made a video called The Death of Economics 101 about 18 months mm -hmm. ago or something, uh, where this was one of the central things that I addressed. I think one of the things that we can be sure of in that literature, though, is that it shows that the the basic standard demand supply model of the labor market uh, that you see that you know the scissors the the cross um, is is wrong. Um, it's just it's just too limited. Um, there's too much variation. There's too much going on that's outside the purview of the model. If it were true, we'd expect to see you know uh, consistent mechanical effects of minimum wages on employment, which we don't see. Um, and there are also other reasons to disbelieve it. Um, so that's kind of where I take that literature. Like, well, I agree with your mm. point from a normative perspective, from a, the perspective of economic theory, I think it, I mean, and it's a basic model. It's the first model you mm. learn. Of course, it's not going to be the best model of the labor right. market, but the minimum wage debate, in my opinion, does illustrate the shortcomings of that model, which is the same one that people, right wingers and sometimes centrists are, you know, implicitly or explicitly referencing when they say you don't understand basic economics. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, and, and, and I mean, like it also maybe just takes us full circle to the beginning of the conversation because, because if you, uh, you know, I mean, if, if you're, I mean, just, just put crudely, right. If your response to that, like, oh, if you understood basic economics, you would agree with me argument is basically, uh, you know, some version of, uh, you know, some version of, uh, of, oh, you're just a bad faith actor and this and that and the other thing, which all of which might be true, right? But like, it's still, it's still not a very persuasive response. And, you know, people can and should do better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there, you know, there are sophisticated economic arguments for why that person is wrong. Uh, and this is worth right. exploring them. Um, so let's, let's talk a bit more about, um, about the left, about, cancel culture and about about your second book so i mean i yeah. asked you what motivated your first book um yeah. uh, you know I'll, I'll ask the same about about this sure. one yeah um i mean i think the second book uh canceling comedians while the world burns is is an expression of pretty extreme frustration which is present around the edges even in the first book uh that uh when I, I kind of talk about, um, you know, I mean, part of the first book is an argument. Oh, what's that? Sorry, I, I just uh, I just coughed, but I thought my mic was off. Um, oh, sorry, no worries. Sorry, no sorry worries. for that, everybody. <laughs> uh, but, you know, part of the first book is an argument for debate and engagement and all this stuff. And is and, and part of that argument, you know, it, it involves how toxic can be if if our sort of only tools for um, dealing with disagreements are are mockery and moral condemnation and that's turned inward right so so in some ways i think the seeds of the first but the second book are already in there but there were also like a bunch of much more specific you know things that had happened uh in between the time i was writing the first one and and when i started writing the second one that um uh, that that motivated me to uh, to to think there was something here that really needed to uh, to be addressed, um, and you know, and and I should also say, you know, part of part of that evolution too is is my uh, 
uh, is is just spending a lot of time talking about stuff like this with you know with my late friend Michael Brooks and that the, a lot of the way he saw this stuff rubbed off on me, but uh, but I think you know but I think in particular uh, there's a lot that I I would see and you know the the title of the book is is an expression of the frustration that drove the book I mean it's kind of a, an attempt to sort of get people's attention and sort of like grab their collar and be like, no, come on, this, this is important. Listen to this. Uh, but of course the flip side of that is that if you have a provocatively titled book, a lot of, you know, uh, many more people will know the title of the book than will know what you say in the book. And, you know, <laughs> that can, that can obviously have its own pitfalls. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I thought basically that there was a culture of counterproductive moralism that uh, all too often uh, the left would get sucked into and I wanted uh, to to think about both what what's kind of wrong with that, why that's bad, uh, and um, and and uh, and and why it happens. So I, you know, basically the the sort of core analysis of of the book is that you know, I wouldn't claim it's monocausal or this is the only thing that makes people act this way, but uh, that I think that. A lot of this is a result, you know, of uh, a extended period of political powerlessness that in societies like the U.S. and the U.K., anything to the left of just kind of standard liberalism has been sort of wandering around in the wilderness for a long time. And that, and that once that happens for too long, people sort of stop thinking about politics as a realistic project to change the world for the better and start thinking of it as this kind of symbolic moral protest against injustice that can uh, that can all too easily become just very performative or shade into uh, questioning whether other people are, are sort of uh, displaying the right moral commitment. And, you know, I, I thought there were a series of, of incidents that had happened that in, in various ways made me think that. Like, so a, uh, you know, a famous example that's, that's mentioned in the book is during the 2020 uh, burning campaign, um, you know, Joe Rogan, uh, who, you know, is, uh, has, has since drifted, you know, drifted quite a bit, uh, in a different political direction. If you look at some of his more recent pronouncements, but at the time liked what Bernie was saying and sort of endorsed him in a very Joe Roganish way, like, Oh man, you know, who do you think you're going to vote for? Oh, yeah, I think probably Bernie, right. You know, and, um, and the Bernie campaign, um, quote unquote touted that. Uh, by uh, by by clipping it out and um, and saying you, you know promoting that because the a, this incredibly popular uh, comedian and podcaster with a vast audience of people who wouldn't necessarily be expected to vote in democratic primaries uh, praised your guy of course you would uh, of course you would tap that and put that out and a lot of people got very upset about that uh i, I didn't even say this in the book because i think this information didn't come out until later but like aoc apparently was very upset about that and in this way that sort of um really bespoke this problem to me that like what, what is your what is your intention is your intention to change the world for the better in which case you should want the sort of broadest coalition of people who might be imperfect and might disagree with you on some things was at the same time as they agree with you on the others to support you is is that your goal right that you that you want to you want to sort of spread support for what you're doing far and wide or is your goal to to have this sort of exclusive club of the people who are right about everything and um and and i obviously it, there's not a simple like I've, i don't want to paint with too broad a brush here because i don't think that would be accurate but uh, but but I worried that too many people who had good intentions were slipping into doing the second thing, and that's why I wrote the book. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's it's really really common. I think I mean there's a lot going on, isn't there? I think um, there's there's the marginalization right that's that's been been happening for a long time of the left and and the, the lack of power. Uh, that you talk about I do think and this is something that you start to talk about I think towards the end of the book that you know it, it sort of just feels good and it's very good to get caught up in it mm -hmm. and I think I think this partly has something to do with just the design of social media and it's especially Twitter as a platform 
Um, and it, it, you know, one of my one of my things that I don't get about leftists who completely deny there's a cancel culture is that like mm -hmm. you know, Twitter is a capitalist company, right? They <laughs> they know how to use psychological tricks, the same as advertisers have for a long time, to get you to do react in the way they want, and they have or their algorithms have found that outrage is good for them because it keeps you on the platform and it keeps you engaged, right? And therefore, they're going to encourage you to do that, and it really works. Um, and that seems to me to be a very left-wing argument <laughs> about the existence of cancel culture on social media, but it's maybe not recognized by, by some people. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, I, w I will also say that... Um, Sometimes people who say there's, who really insist there's no such thing as cancel culture are uh, a little inconsistent in this in, in ways that I think maybe betray uh, not being totally confident in, in their position or, or being of two minds. So, for example, uh, you'll see people kind of insisting out of one side of their mouth that... Um, Canceling is just criticism that the only people who talk about cancel culture are wealthy and powerful celebrities who don't, you know, who, who just who just can't stand a little bit of criticism and uh, and that really it doesn't hurt anybody. Nobody's really canceled. And out of the other side of their mouth, they will they will say that uh, this is actually like a really important tool for like justice for oppressed people. It's accountability. It's consequences. And of course, look, criticism isn't accountability or consequences, right? That's not a, that's not a punishment to be, to just be criticized, right? I mean, it's, it's a, you know, surely people must, you know, like there has to be some kind of psychological harm or something in order for the, the, the accountability and, and consequences talk uh, to, to make any sense. Uh, and, and I think that actually that uh, on that, um, you know, and, and I and I think that there's also uh, I think there's also a sort of funny bait and switch where if somebody you um, if somebody you like uh, is being canceled, then suddenly you do think cancel culture is real. But but you think but now now it's called targeted harassment. And and so so, yeah, that like they're they're being, you know, because there's some giant pile on where people are, are screaming at them and trying to get them fired over nonsense. Uh, that like now you can see that that's a real problem and you apply this other name to it, you know, but if, if it's happening to somebody you don't care about, then that it's not. And, um, and I think that, I think that actually, so, so there are two issues here and I, I don't want to be a little bit careful about separating them. One is sort of what the left does and, you know, how I think maybe sort of left participation in some of these, some of these broader trends or, the sort of particular versions that play out in the left can be bad and counterproductive, which is like where I'm very focused in the, most of the book. But then there's another question. You know, I, I wrote an article about Jacobin for this around the time the book came out called We Can't Cancel Our Way to a Better World, where you know, I, I make partially the point you just made and say, look, if anything is a broader issue, um, rather than just kind of being in denial that there's a problem here, that like whatever label you use to apply it to, that there's something bad that's being gestured at when people use this label, um, I think it'd be better for the left to sort of claim it as an issue, to say, look, unlike right-wingers who might bring it up just to sort of score culture war points, but don't really have an, have a plausible analysis of where it comes from, and they certainly don't have anything like a solution, uh, we can offer, at least to some extent, both of those things that we can say, look, um, cancel culture or whatever you want to call it um, is a result in many ways of the kind of neoliberal hellscape that we live in, That uh, both in the sense that people are very um, atomized and alienated and all too often feel the most sense of connection to other people online, and also in the sense that that there are all of these profit-driven, terrible incentives built into the social media platforms, like you're talking about. A uh, an analogy I often think about is the on um, uh, Ronson. I, I'm always I'm always worried I'm getting that guy's mid name mixed up because you know whether it's it's that or the other way around. But uh, the uh, it's um, he. Um, you know, he wrote this book called uh, "So You've Been Publicly Shamed," where he um, he has this nice analogy about uh, these like 
uh, traffic signs that I've, I forget what they're called, but they, um, but the like the rather than the traditional speed limit sign that just has the the number on it of the speed that you're supposed to not drive faster than, it'll have that, and then next to it there's the it'll show you the speed that you're going, and in principle it doesn't seem like these should actually help because it doesn't give the driver any information they don't already have that like I'll, an old low tech sign will tell you what the speed limit is and every car ever already has a speedometer in it that tells you how fast you're going right so there's no new information there but just that sort of uh immediate feedback loop that sort of like a um, tiny immediate psychological incentive of like watching the two numbers side by side and watching the one come into alignment with the other studies do seem to show these are actually pretty effective and and they actually do reduce speeding in accidents uh, which in that case is great, right? But then I think that the uh, the kind of immediate feedback loop of incentives in um, that are built into how the social media platforms work is terrible because because uh, you know if if a, you know you get that just um, you know immediate endorphin kick of like likes and retweets and all that stuff, and in a way where it's it's very tempting to just um, you know to like it really disincentivizes like slowing down and seeing whether, whether whether the person you're denouncing or leading other people to have outrage against actually did anything all that bad uh cuz it's cuz it's uh you know you get this kind of immediate reward uh for for jumping to conclusions and sort of throwing the first stone of outrage in ways that uh in ways that uh, that other people will follow and and so even when oftentimes like in, i think in that jacobin article i mentioned uh wendell potter i believe is his name who is a uh, former health insurance executive and lobbyist who uh had a you know many years ago had a come to jesus moment about what he was doing with his life and has since devoted himself to campaigning for single-payer health care and he he you know posted the kind of thing that wendell you know, wendell potter if you follow him on twitter posts all the time which is uh, the fact that it was something like the fact that people don't understand even in the middle of the pandemic, how much Medicare for all would help us really shows how effective the propaganda was that I spread when I was a health insurance executive. And this guy who, you know, there's no point to naming because, you know, I think he since deleted the tweet, but he, he's like a, I think he's like a Marvel comics writer or something kind of mid tier Twitter account uh, quote tweeted and said, Oh my God, this blank actually blanking admitted it. Uh, and it got like 10,000 likes and retweets by the time enough people had told him who Wendell Potter was that he uh, took it down. And literally it would have taken him like two seconds to like click over to his name. But again, all of these processes really disincentivized that. And last thing I'd say about this, also I would point out that one reason why I think the left could actually effectively claim this issue potentially is that we actually have a program that could at least, I'm not going to say it would make it go away, but it, it would at least like um, sand off some of the sharp edges of the problem. Because why is it, like, I, like let's just America-centric here for a moment, you know, why is it that um, certainly at least in the United States, um, like what's the sort of biggest like reason that, uh, you know, being canceled online is, 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 is worrying to people is alarming. And you know, why, why is it that doxing has so much terror and it's not the only reason, but I mean, one of the big reasons is that most people don't have any kind of security in their job and they're, they're worried that, that, that like they, they could be fired uh, very easily that, uh, that, you know, even if your boss doesn't really care very much about whatever's going on, they could just decide that it's a better business decision to just cut you loose and um, and they have no meaningful protection against that. Whereas if you know if we did what the left wants and change labor laws to make it easier to organize unions and harder to fire people, uh, then uh, then you know that would at least at least the the terror of that would would be considerably reduced. Yeah, I mean, if you I think if you're trying to get people fired, um, unless that person is you know someone who's very very wealthy and and the, you know a politician or someone who you think actually isn't fit to run for office, um, you know if you're trying to get kind of ordinary people fired, then uh, you know I, I, you really need to reflect on your your credentials as a leftist, right? Yeah. No. I yes. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, you sort of you you paint this picture in the book of these these leftists as people who see basically 
um, un- uncrossable lines absolutely everywhere. In economics, I think we'd call them lexicographic preferences, right? But it's like, literally, you just like, there's there's some lines you won't cross. And that's that's true for everyone. Of course, there are lines you won't cross, you know, whether they're things that you've actually experienced or some hypothetical extreme situation. Um, you may never murder somebody, for example. Uh, but, you know, for for some people on Twitter, they they seem to see these uncrossable lines in like, whether they whether they you know it's an uncrossable line for them not to tweet about somebody else's transgression which is just like so much more um so much such a more extreme position right yeah so so in the uh in, in that chapter of the book uh part of the context is that i'm talking about um about the Basically about, you know, thinking about costs and benefits and um, and I do the, the logic nerd thing there and, and talk about decision theory a little bit and, you know, thinking about what are the most likely outcomes of what you're doing and, and you know, how, how good or bad, you know, those would be. Uh, and um, but but then I, I sort of say at the end, like, look, don't get me wrong. You don't just have to be like a pure utilitarian to agree with what I'm saying. I'm not, in fact, one of those. Uh, you can think that there are lines of, of principle that like, even if it would be advantageous to cross them, you still shouldn't cross. That's fine. I'm not disputing that. But, um, but, but I, I would say that if, you're, if your um, you know, moral or political map is just full <laughs> of those uncrossable lines, you probably need a better map. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I can I completely agree with that. Um, and uh, yeah, it goes back to just I think for some people it just is politics, right? And that's just policing those boundaries on Twitter or or you know online or you know occasionally in real life, right? Um, you see, you do give the example of the of the famous uh, DSA convention, right, where there was a. a you know, I mean, it was a small part, you say this, it was a small part of the overall convention, but there was this exchange, which I think was sufficient to make most people, even if they were, you know, out and out socialists yeah. and woke, you know, self-professed woke people and stuff, uh, cringe quite a lot because there were just all these obscenely strong boundaries about what you were and weren't allowed to do and it seemed like people were just trying to one up with each other with like how ridiculous and unrealistic they could get yeah and i mean this this is a place where i'm just gonna i mean i guess people can go out and uh as the conspiracy theorists say do your own research about whether what i'm saying here is true (laughs) but um but um but i i am just gonna make a an assertion of fact here and say that I think there's a certain kind of of lefty who I'll see online who like to tell each other that none of this is a problem that um that like it's only like in fact it's only like I don't know um you know a feet PMC journalist or somebody who actually are 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 uh, who actually care about a leftist being ridiculous in these ways and it doesn't bother anybody else and and I think that's just exactly wrong I think I certainly have never had a conversation with somebody who's not um, fully in our political bubble who has looked at those clips and not been like, oh, my God, these are some very unpleasant, crazy people who I I don't want to spend any time around. That is any normal person's reaction to that. And when I say normal, what I mean by normal is just like not somebody who's fully committed to all the things that we're committed to and, you know, thinks about the, thinks about politics all day, every day, right? Like, I, I think that anybody who's a normal person in that sense is going to take one look at that and, um, and think some very dismissive thoughts about the people that they're seeing. And what, you know, what bothers me about this, beyond the fact that it's, it's just an own goal, it's, it's unnecessary, right? You don't actually need to, uh, you don't have- actually to uh, to alienate people by doing this because none of this matters very much. It's not worth it. Is that it, it's, it's like, okay, this would even be bad enough if it was like, I don't know, James O'Keefe or somebody went in there with hidden cameras to capture this footage. But, you know, DSA was streaming this conference um, and everybody there presumably knew that. And they're still acting this way, which 
makes me think that it's not even really occurring to certain people. And again, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here, but like enough people for those to be produced that, um, that it would be a problem. Like, is this really the face that you want to show to like anybody in the world who happens to tune in to, uh, to watch this? And then conversely, look, if I had to guess, probably most people in the hall were like silently rolling their eyes a little bit. But nobody's saying anything, and I totally get why nobody's saying anything. Because it's like, look, you don't, you didn't join DSA in the first place because you you want to argue with crazy people about whether you know whether you should be allowed to clap. Right? You you joined it. You know, you're involved in left politics because you care about you know capitalism and imperialism and police violence and union busting and all those other vastly more important things out there in the world. And um, and I get that. But then the sort of place that I was in that led me to write the book is the problem or one problem is that if you just kind of hold your tongue about all the silly counterproductive things that people who agree with you do, then that leaves anybody who's sort of casually looking in from the outside with the impression that everybody is is down with all of that. Everybody is like that. Uh, and then that's a club that they don't really want to join and you, you don't have as many people to work on all those other much more important issues. I think you risk being thought of as, you know, cold and unsympathetic, right? And uh, this kind of goes back to the beginning of the conversation. But I mean, the examples, you know, look, I, I don't have all of the experiences out there to be able to fully engage with this. But two of the examples struck struck me because as somebody who considers myself to be probably somewhat on the spectrum of autism right um oh. i have i i have an extremely um famously among my friends sensitive sense of smell um oh. so that it, like i can just smell something burning or like garbage ages away it's, it's a absolute pain in the ass i i would not like a room where they said the chi- what was it the chill out room cannot have too strong smells Right, it was yeah. something that was one of the rules, and you're just like, as somebody with a really strong sense of smell, um, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Same goes for like the all the not clapping stuff. You know what I mean? In certain situations, like too much clapping and noise can give me anxiety. Sure. Um, again, like it's just, it's just, it's just completely ridiculous. Like you can't restrict people this much for a minority. And to be honest, right, this is going to sound really cold, but we, we're here now. Um, I think if you are that set off by that type of thing, then I probably wouldn't attend a meeting of thousands of people. Um, like, I feel like that's the solution. I don't, but I don't know what you think of that. Am I being an arsehole now? No, I mean, I mean I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I would question, you know, if, you, if it's going to be that much of a problem, uh, you know, how you're getting through a variety of other situations. But yeah, I mean, I think that there's got to be some kind of balance here between uh between sort of maximalist accommodation for probably very very few people in that room um and you know and i I also wonder if you know maybe distribution of earplugs a few sets of earplugs (laughs) might might do do, you know i have a friend who takes earplugs to things like that if if she goes Um, yeah it's fine she doesn't go that often the way she does she takes earplugs yeah, I mean that might be an, that might be an easier solution, you know. But like, you know, you got there has to be some kind of balance between um, between sort of cranking the dial of accommodation up to eleven uh, for for the sake of a tiny number of of attendees for whom there might even be you know reasonable solutions anyway, uh, and and thinking about what kind of impression you're, you're going to get give to to everybody else to anybody who's not just soaking in the political subculture of the left and is going to look at this and they're going to see a lot of people who seem to be very invested in monitoring each other for s- some pretty trivial uh transgressions and and i would just ask like is like uh, is the conversation with whatever whatever amount of time you have to, to engage with somebody, is the conversation you want to have really like, this is why I don't think it's okay to clap? <laughs> yeah, yeah, versus climate change, for instance. Uh, yeah. Um, so, Ben, I'm just, I'm aware we were scheduled to finish at six. We started a bit late, but I don't know what your schedule is. I mean, I've got a couple more things I'd like to speak about, I'm, I'm, but if I'm, you've got to go, you're okay. To, yeah. I'm happy to go for a few more minutes, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um... A few more minutes is that to be interpreted literally? Or, or, or like, I mean, I don't. I, yeah. I, 
I, I am happy to go until it's it's okay. actually been you know two hours. Yeah, let's say. yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's uh, we, we, that's... Did, we did start late, which which yeah. I, 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 I I which is entirely my fault. I was I was I was up against a, a deadline and and not uh, and not succeeding very well and finish it when I thought I was going to finish it. No, no, it's completely fine. But at the same time, I don't want you to feel obliged to like <laughs> ruin no, no, the rest no. of we're, your we're day good. by we're by good. overdoing this. Okay, so let's. So one of the things you you do. Um, and I've, I feel like I've had this vague thought myself, but you actually articulate it properly, is you draw a, 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 an analogy between this behavior, the cancel culture behavior, and, and corporate human resources departments, um, which I think is apt and mm -hmm. also quite funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, this, you know, I, I said earlier that I don't think there's, there's one cause to all of this stuff, and I do think that there is an element of what's going on here that, you know, certainly as the stuff plays out in the left, that has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of people come out of, um, you know, what we'd sort of roughly think of as like a, the professional managerial kind of layer of society, uh, oftentimes in a downwardly mobile way in one way or another. Um, and, um, you know, which, like, to be clear, I'm I'm also talking about myself here, right? You know, this this all this all describes me uh, as a somebody who's at this point mostly a writer, but is is a um, but you know is also a adjunct professor. It doesn't it doesn't get much more you know lump and PMC than that? But uh, but I think that the that I think people often sort of carry with them into the left habits that they've learned from uh, from these from these environments. And I also think, you know, frankly, part of the explanation of at least part of what we're often thinking of when we use phrases like cancel culture, um, that like my friend Daniel Bessner often emphasizes is precisely the fact that there are all these traditional middle-class kinds of occupations like, um, journalism or academia that are becoming much more precarious. Um, due to larger, you know, structural changes to the economy and, um, and oftentimes the sort of ladders of career success there are becoming fewer and people fight each other more bitterly uh, for, uh, for, for, you know, access to those, you know, those ladders uh, and, and to kind of claw each other off of them. And, uh, and oftentimes there is a certain kind of social justice -y stuff that I think if we're being real about this is a very effective tool to use in those kinds of power struggles. And, um, and I think that, this is, um, you know, there is this, there is this kind of thing that I, I do think of as like kind of a, you know, human resources department liberalism, you know, where you're very, um, you're very concerned with making sure that everybody's using exactly the right language and, you know, exactly the right social codes and isn't sort of engaged in infractions of some, you know, subtle and poorly defined rules um that that does uh yeah i mean i think the sort of initial gentle phase of uh of this stuff the uh the calling in often does feel uncomfortably like a uh, like a visit from uh from the human resources department which is also probably not the best um you know probably not the best thing to feel like if if you're interested in um if your long-term goal is to build a mass movement of working class people do you follow the YouTube channel Carefree Wondering at all? Um, uh, oh, Carefree Wondering. He's a fellow. He's a fellow philosophy professor. He's. I think he's Dutch. Um, sorry if I've got that wrong. Uh, but he um, has kind of strawberry blonde hair, um, and he does a lot of stuff on wokeness. Um, and he's a pretty left wing guy. But I think it's interesting your analogy between corporate HR and cancel culture because. What he says is, look, you know, all of the things that someone like Jordan Peterson is objecting to, you can understand them on their own terms and in, in the terms we've discussed as a problem that's that's on the left um, and as, you know, cancel culture or whatever. Um, but also what you need to understand is that they're, they're really promoted by profit-seeking capitalist companies. 
Um, so this mm -hmm. kind of wokeness and this, you know, superficial idea of diversity, you know, girl boss type stuff, uh, you know, more female CEOs, the, you know, the famous image of the, uh, the meme of the... Uh, you know the the drone that's got the lgbtq yeah. flag and blm on it but it's still bombing afghanistan um you know th those types of things they're they're all wokeness and you know to have i think a richer understanding of this we need like i guess what you would call a materialist analysis yeah i i think that's correct uh i i and i think that you know oftentimes maybe even to sharpen the point and i should say I would make a distinction between what we often think of as wokeness as, you know, as a sort of very performative cultural phenomenon with um, underlying social policy issues, which is a distinction that I think is often not made when talking about this. And, and it's, it's easy for people to, to sort of get it twisted. What's, what's being talked about uh, because, because look, I mean, I, I have um, like uninterestingly, sort of standard cookie cutter progressive views about all the social policy issues. Uh, but, but I do think that this, this kind of performative cultural wokeness is not just sort of what a lot of people on the left, I think would say, which is like, okay, sure. It's like maybe misused uh, by, um, you know, corporate America, or it's, you know, being appropriated in some bad way by corporate America or by like the CIA. People may remember that it, uh, I don't know. A few months ago, last year, I don't remember exactly. Time is a flat circle, but uh, <laughs> the uh, there was not that long ago the CIA actually put out an ad uh, in which the a, a CIA employee was um, using a bunch of buzzwords to to sort of emphasize what a great workplace it was, and they said that was a what did they call themselves like a cis a cisgender millennial? I'm a cisgender with millennial with generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, yes, I think that was the moment that it lost me. I think because when because when you first listen to it, she says like I think she has an indigenous background. Uh, and you're yeah. like okay, yeah, you know, I'm 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 with you. When she said with generalized anxiety disorder, I was like fucking hell, join the club like that. Why are you talking about that? And then and then you find out it's an advert for the CIA, and you're like bloody <laughs> hell. I wonder how much generalized anxiety disorder they've caused. Yeah, it's that is <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Well, she, well, she does emphasize that she speaks Spanish, which I think is probably very helpful if you work for the CIA. But, um, <laughs> you know, if you're the if you're in the overthrowing lag, leftist governments of Latin America, yes. <laughs> that's a very um, morbid, morbid laugh. All right, <laughs> but, yeah. um, but but I I think I'd actually push back a little bit about against the claim that it's like what's going on is that these these entities have sort of misused or appropriated. Um, this this kind of cultural expression or this kind of identity politics because I think in some ways I think in some ways what's going on here is that the underlying thing really lends itself to to that kind of of use right uh, which which again I'm not you know I mean I think we can walk and chew bubble gum here and make some some um, you know and make some distinctions right you know you you shouldn't uh, anti discrimination laws are good right yelling racial slurs at people is bad. Um, but also this, this kind of, um, this kind of emphasis on individual virtue and sort of micro analysis of interactions and language and all that stuff, uh, is sort of perfect for, you know, whatever the CIA fortune 500 companies, whoever, um, uh, because it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't threaten you know the the foundation of of their um, you know their claim on on power and resources, and it's it's very focused on exactly the kind of thing that uh, they're quite happy for uh, for people to uh, to focus on, which is uh, which is that um, basically like working on yourself, uh, doing you know like like yeah, mm -hmm. I mean why wouldn't you know if if you're a big corporation, absolutely bring you know bring Robin D'Angelo in and she can lead people on a vision quest about their internalized whiteness, and um, everybody can focus on that. You know that mm -hmm. uh, they're um, they are they're thoroughly they're thoroughly happy to do it because it's a politics of individual morality more than anything else, and. Um, and in some ways, I think it's, I mean, on a larger social level, it reflects some of what we were talking about earlier with the left, that 
there are certain kinds of intractable problems that if you sort of given up on, you know, you can you can redirect your your energy to to all of this. You know, that like I think a lot of times like when people use phrases like um, you know structural or systemic racism, what they're thinking of, you know, and and they're not talking about um, like actual ongoing discrimination. What they're really thinking of more than anything are just sort of long term patterns of of material distribution, that um, you know poverty, um, you know being concentrated. Um, in some demographic groups more than others. Um, although, you know, I think if you actually look at the uh, racial wealth gap, most of that's at the top. And and there's something a little bit uh, funny about this. I mentioned Adolf Reed earlier. He, uh, you know, he has an article I remember reading a little while ago where he, he talks about being on a black nationalist podcast and he's arguing with the host and, and he makes this point that, you know, most of this wealth that people are talking about with the gap isn't held by most people in either group. And and the guy says, yeah, but the white collective wealth is so much greater. And 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 Adolf says, well, okay, but like, what am I imagining? Some like waitress in Ohio who's like about to get evicted, and she's worried about how she's going to make rent. Is there some white collective wealth fund she can she can apply for a, um, a you know a payment from? Right, that doesn't really seem like how any of this works. Um, but uh, but you know, but it is certainly true that poverty. Is also uh, extreme poverty is is distributed in a wildly unequal way among different uh, different demographic groups, and and of course that what that means is that all the stuff that rides along with with poverty, all of the social ills that ride along with it, all of the uh, clunky, heavy-handed responses to social ills in terms of policing and incarceration uh, that go go with it, uh, ride along with that. And and this is oftentimes what's really um, inspiring this stuff, right? I mean, like the when uh, the you know when George Floyd was was murdered uh, by by police for for uh, for trying to pass a bad uh, twenty dollars uh, at a uh, at a grocery store, which by the way is an infraction that I think any sane society would like the the punishment for that would maybe be like. At worst, there'd be a picture of you behind the counter. You know, don't uh, don't serve this guy. You know, but that would certainly be it. Uh, but you know, when he when when he was murdered for that, and and there was there was you know correctly widespread outrage about this, and and um, and a sort of national wave of of unrest about it. Uh, that ended up being wonderful for the careers of the Robin D'Angelos of the world because because so much of the energy about that got redirected to that. And, and it's again, it's the sort of it seems like a large scale version of the same the same issue we're talking about on the on the left, which is that you can't uh, if you're you know if you're like actually doing anything about the way policing works in America is really hard politically. Certainly, doing anything about the underlying distribution of wealth is really hard politically, but um, Getting a name changed on like a street sign is really easy. Getting a Fortune 500 company to use the phrase "Black Lives Matter" in something mm-hmm. that it does is really easy. Getting somebody fired is really easy. Getting, uh, you know, getting you know diversity training going at a workplace is really easy. All of these things are incredibly easy, and I think sometimes, you know, when you can't do the hard but more important things, you know, it's it's tempting to sort of go looking for for battles that you can win. Yeah, that's that's really well put. Um, I just want to correct myself um, and say uh, that Carefree Wondering, uh, aka Hans George Moiler, is uh, German. He's not Dutch, so I'm sorry about okay. that. Okay, uh, but well, yeah, we're, we're, I mean, do better. Yeah, yeah. Do better. <laughs> he uh, he uh, t- he uh, t- he he talks about this idea of like you know building up a profile and how much of our society yeah. and, and this chimes with social media as well as about a profile and sometimes you can find which I think is you what you were alluding to um uh, earlier in what you said about you know how some of these characteristics uh you know whether they're um ethnic characteristics or generalized anxiety disorder can become a part of this this kind of profile and it can all be quite superficial um even though there are obviously huge issues with these types of mm. things that need to be addressed um using them as a you know putting them on on your on your linkedin or you know whatever something like that is just a superficial and quite a capitalistic individualistic exercise right um so 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 ben um we we've been chatting for two hours it's been really uh, enjoyable 
Um, I want to say, I confess, I was only able to read two out of three of your books. Uh, I didn't read the one about Christopher Hitchens in preparation for this. So I thought maybe I'd just give you an opportunity to plug it because it is your latest book. Um, and also sure. just tell, tell us where you, we can find you. Certainly. Um, yeah, there is one other book, but that was that's like an academic book. Nobody nobody reads that. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, the yes, yeah, so the Christopher Hitchens book. It's called Christopher Hitchens: What He Got Right, How He Went Wrong, and Why He Still Matters. And uh, it was it, it came out um, several months back at the about the ten year anniversary of his death, and uh, and he's. You know, I, I wrote it because he's a figure that I've always found really interesting and compelling, even though I think he was like disastrously wrong about some really important things in the final years of his life. And I wanted to explore that. Um, and uh, both, you know, what was what was good about him, what was bad about him, uh, what could maybe be learned from uh, from from some of the really bad mistakes that he made at, at the um, at the end, you know, when, when he was doing things like supporting the war in Iraq. Um, and, and it's, it's something that really grew out of, uh, some segments that I did on the Michael Brooks show where we, we kind of look back at old clips of him and, and sort of, you know, appreciated some of what was originally good, uh, about that. So, uh, you can get that book and all of the other books, um, at all the usual places that you need know, buy books, you know, Amazon or whatever. Uh, but certainly anybody who's in the United States, uh, can um, and I, I wish I knew you know global equivalents to this. Uh, but uh, at least anybody in the United States uh, can uh, can get all these books uh, from a place I would always sort of try to steer people to if I can, which is a worker-owned bookstore in Baltimore. You can order books from online called Red Emma's, like the name Emma. Um, and uh, so that's that's Red Emma's uh, dot org, um, and. Uh, yeah, otherwise uh, you can you can find me uh, very regularly at Jacobin uh, and somewhat less regularly at a few other places. Uh, Daily Beast is is probably the the second most regular, and I have a uh, you know, podcast YouTube show called uh, Give Them an Argument, uh, which is uh, which which airs on. Monday and Thursday nights at eight Eastern and lives forever afterwards on the internet. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, ben for, for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. Yeah. It was really fun. See you. Um, okay, everybody. So that was, uh, that was really good. And, um, uh... Do I need to remove that? Probably not. It's just my chat with Ben. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still uh, fairly crap at like organizing the end, end and beginning of these things. Uh, I'm actually, I'm actually really bad at hellos and goodbyes in real life. It's one of my traits. I'm terrible at both of them for some reason. Um, and I, uh, yeah, on the podcast, I'm also really bad at them. So, podcast slash stream. Um, anyway, so thanks a lot. Um, I actually, you were all arguing about fucking Stalin and the Soviet Union, and there is a chapter in ben's second book canceling comedians while the word world burns about tankies um this channel is anti-tanky i want to be very clear mods be aggressive like i'd rather you block someone who doesn't deserve it uh <laughs> than, um, than uh than just like allow it to unfurl because one person can very quickly destabilize an internet community and yeah it's the opposite of innocent until proven guilty but you know this is uh this is a private channel and it's mine so uh anyway um um thank you very much um that was that was uh that was really really uh really good chat and uh i'll see you all soon i'll see you all on friday um, I'm talking to Trevon Logan, who's a, an economist um, who's written a lot on, on race issues. Uh, so that should be really interesting. Um, and now I am going to have dinner. Bye, everyone.